Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Rowing Chat. Rowing Chat is the podcast network for the sport of rowing. I'm Rebecca Caro. I started this network in 2013, and I'm always interested in hearing from people who might like to join in and put their show on the airwaves. So do get in touch if that's something that might interest you. You can subscribe and watch and listen to past episodes at our website, rowing.chat. And for now, I'm just going to take a brief scanter through our sponsor. So this month, I'm continuing to develop the rowing directory. It's on the rowing.chat website. Just look for the word directory in the top menu. These are the businesses whose profiles have been updated. Red Boy Row, who does recycled custom clothing, Croker Oars UK, and John has spares and can make custom or off-the-shelf oars for you. The Coxon Academy, where you can get recruited or learn to cox. Exafly, which is a flywheel eccentric lifting gain service and product. The Oar Board, a stand-up paddleboard rowing for sea or river rowing. Whitehall Rowing, classic rowboats that are designed to go on the ocean. Annabelle Ayres, the artist who does prints, clothes and beautiful rowing gifts. Bont Rowing, who makes shoes with carbon soles. Ludum, the performance analysis and rowing team management software. I then have three who have done mini interviews. And if you go into their listing on the rowing directory, you'll be able to see a short episode of the podcast with them where they showcase their products. The San Diego Crew Classic, which, of course, is a virtual regatta coming up later this month in March. The Coffee Corporation, who make the simulator, which is an indoor rowing or sculling machine, which includes feathering your oars. And Ready All Row, who do psychological training camps for youth rowers. Now, I am delighted to welcome to the podcast, Lois Molina. Lois, welcome. Can you hear me, Lois? You can't hear me. Ah, that's very strange. I don't know why Lois can't hear me. Um, Lois, can you hover... You're absolutely sure your microphone's working? No? You you can't hear me at all? I can't hear you, Rebecca. That is too weird. Um, uh, okay. Um, Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Right, you're going to have to guess the questions. So, um, I'm just putting, um, I'm going to ask Lois to introduce herself and I'll just do it like this. Can you hear me now? All right. Well, I'm still not hearing you, but um, we can, we'll make this work. We'll make it work. So <laughs> thank you for having me. And I'm, I'm really delighted to be here. I, I come to you from Portland, Oregon, where uh, the, the water is warming up and we're having some sunny days. I've been back on the water once and it's, it's very exciting. The clubs are gearing back up again and we're still going out in singles, but um, things are, are looking up. Um, <clears throat> and I'm not sure what Rebecca has told you um, now. So would you? Okay, so Lois is the author of The Grammar of Untold Stories. She's a professional writer, and this is her latest book. So Lois, do you want to tell us about the stories? Well, the um, the Grammar of Untold Stories is a collection of 16 essays that uh, came out last September. And it's the culmination of the work that I've been doing writing literary nonfiction 
for the past um, oh five years uh, since retiring in 2015, which is uh, around the same time I I started rowing, um, and I've. Uh, I'm a firm believer that getting out and moving your body helps with the creative process. So uh, although only one of the essays in this book has to do with rowing, certainly I think that there is a symbiotic relationship between creativity and, and, and physical activity. She's absolutely right. And the book is actually a collection of different essays. I perhaps describe it as an anthology. There are sections about family, about work and about home. But the reason that Lois and I connected is her one rowing story, which she alluded to just now. And so what I'd like to do is to invite Lois for the rest of this podcast to read the story. So what I'm going to do now is tell you that the story that she's going to be reading is called Synchronicity of healing. Thank you, Rebecca. The synchronicity of healing. Before dawn, the river is black, reflecting lights from downtown buildings at the water's edge. We hear a train whistle on the tracks that parallel the river, the occasional car rattle on the metal bridge that divides the, the town. The earthy dampness smells like morning in a rainforest. At this hour, the water is smooth, and we don't have to struggle to keep the boat set, stable. We tap the oar handles down at the end of the stroke to pop the blades out of the water, then roll the oars so that the blades are parallel with the surface. This feathering allows them to skim just above the water, like the wings of a gull, until we have floated as far forward as we can in our seats. Arms reaching across bent knees, energy coiled in our bodies. We square the blades again and drop them into the water a split second before pushing against feet locked onto the boat. We feel the urge of power that propels the shell. Then we repeat. Repeat in a rhythm set by the port and starboard rowers closest to the stern. We each watch the shoulders of the woman in the seat in front to match the swing of her body at the end of the stroke to feather the blade at precisely the same time, to start sliding the seat and stopping it exactly when she does, adjusting the speed of the movement in between to accommodate for shorter legs or longer torso. Focus. Only the coxswain speaks. The slightest disparity in the synchronous movement can tip the balance of this narrow light shell. Readjusting requires coming into harmony with one another silently. We leave everything on the dock but this single-minded concentration on hands, arms, back, legs, feet, glutes, hamstrings, quads, pecs, lats, core, When we introduced ourselves on the first day of our Learn to Row class, we were asked what brought us to the river. Some had rowed in college. Some had family members who rowed. I'd happened across an announcement and had been attracted to what sounded more fun than the circuit training I'd been doing at the gym to try to stem the muscle deterioration that seemed to be accelerating now that I'm in my 60s. When Jo introduced herself, she pointed to me and said, it was her idea. But Joe said yes without hesitation. Just as she said yes when I asked if she wanted to go to the 2015 Women's World Cup, try a new restaurant, come to a reading I was giving. Not that my ideas drive our friendship. I said yes to her accompanying me to an academic conference in Buenos Aires, to attending a performance of contemporary music to using a fallen log to cross a river on the trail we were hiking. Outside of our friendship, Jo said yes to becoming a dean at the college where she taught. I said yes to going back to school at 52 for a PhD when I stumbled upon a program that looked interesting, not unlike the way I found rowing. Three years before we signed up to row, Jo said yes to a risky 
and agonizing treatment for kidney cancer that had metastasized to her lungs. This notion of having to show up at the boathouse for 5 a.m. practice because our teammates depend on us to fill a seat in the boat is new to both of us. Aside from my freshman year of high school, when I played left wing on a field hockey team for a few months before my family moved and I enrolled in a school with no sports teams for girls, I've never played team sports. As an adult, I skied, played tennis, ran, and at times competed in triathlons. Joe, taller than I am and two years older, played basketball in high school under rules that prohibited her from crossing the center court or dribbling too many times before passing. In the 1960s, such exertion was considered too much for fragile girl bodies needed for reproduction. Our teammates in this novice boat chuckle when we tell them this. We are 40 years older than most of them. Most grew up af after Title IX created more opportunities for women in sports. If I'd been paying attention, I would have recognized the signs of synchronicity, of both of us being summoned by the river to heal. Me, newly and involuntarily retired after working for a toxic dean in higher education, Joe, whose simultaneous but planned retirement from a different university was punctuated by regular CT scans to look for any recurrence of the tumors in her lungs. I would have noticed it in the random way rowing crossed our paths, in our absence of questioning what it would entail, in our lack of hesitation in answering yes. Almost 15 years before, Sister Madonna Buter told me her story of synchronicity and healing, of being called and reading signs and answering yes. I interviewed her in her manufactured home in an over 55 community. I knew what everyone in the world of running and triathlon knew about her, her world Ironman records for women over 60, victories and bike crashes, broken bones, resilience, inevitable comparisons to the flying nun grit, perseverance, courage. She wore a gray velour tracksuit that day, Brooks running shoes, and a white turtleneck printed with red and green Christmas bells. A large gold crucifix hung on a chain in the center of her nearly flat chest. She had just run home from mass, literally. While Sister warmed a glazed donut in the toaster oven and the smell of coffee permeated the air, I looked around, pictures and statues of Mary on end tables and the coffee table on the shelves of an entertainment center, juxtaposed with gold colored statues of winged victors, trophies from top finishes in marathons, triathlons, Ironmans. I contemplated the irony of this woman, expected to live a life of humility and prayer, becoming known for the extraordinary capabilities of her muscles bones, capillaries, cartilage, even more noteworthy because of the age at which she started competing. I sat across from her, my yellow legal tablet on the table, my journalist persona. Tell me why you became a nun. She folded her hands on the table like a good student. Oh, you want to start there, she said. Then told a story that came so easily, it seemed she told it before if not to reporters, to herself. A story of a woman who believed she was surrendering to vocation, the word means a call or summons, refusing to recognize doubt and signs of unsuitability. A story of stubbornness and defiance and isolation, of organizational bullying, and a story of healing that started when she took up winning at the age of 48. I didn't know about Sister Madonna when I first raced her in the 1989 Coeur d'Alene Triathlon, 15 years before our interview. It was my second race, and I'd entered it because Coeur d'Alene, a lakefront resort city in North Idaho, was close to where I lived. And though it was also close to Sister Madonna's home in Spokane, Washington, she was there because the race attracted the top names on the triathlon circuit. 
She had already made a name for herself in three Hawaii Ironmans, one of the most challenging athletic competitions in the world. A 2.4 mile swim, followed by a 112 mile bike, finishing with a 26.2 mile run equal to a marathon. The Coeur d'Alene Triathlon was the shorter Olympic distance for triathlons. It began with a swim of one and a half kilometers. I wore a sleeveless wetsuit. My age was inked in indelible black marker on my left deltoid and left calf. Just before the gun echoed across the water to start the race, I waded into the lake from a narrow strip of beach, my breath catching at the cold. Water leaked into my wetsuit, forming a thin layer that was heated by my body. I peed one last time, the warmth spreading down my legs under the neoprene. When the race started, I hopped along the bottom of the lake until I found a depth for swimming and became part of a mass of flailing arms and legs. I was one of the last out of the water. And when I look now at the splits for the race, I see that as I tottered up the beach, on feet so numb they felt like stubs, Sister Madonna had a five-minute lead on her bike. Swinging a leg over mine, I headed for the 40-kilometer bike course. I barely noticed the marsh where buffleheads and mallards glided, the red barn, the smell of wheat fields ready for harvest, or the yellow pine trees that lined the climb to the crest of the final hill. I was a stronger cyclist than swimmer, each time I passed a competitor, I looked at the age marked on her shoulder. I did not pass any nuns. Sister Madonna had a 20-minute lead on me by the time I racked my bike, dropped my helmet, and set off on a 10-kilometer run. Only a world record holder could have caught her then. I crossed the finish line ninth out of the 12 women in my 36 to 40 age group. Sister Madonna had picked up another six and a half minutes on me during the run. When the complete race results arrived in the mail, I looked closely at the times for women in the older age groups. That's when I saw Sister Madonna Buter's name and time and age, 59. That's when I started to wonder about her story. I wondered too about the women I saw on the course whose arms displayed ages over 40. I knew that, like me, they'd had limited opportunities to enjoy sports and discover athletic ability. I wondered what their stories were. What called them? How did they find their stride? Had they braved the kind of taunts and ostracism that tomboys suffered? Did they find a community of women who understood and even mentored them? At the boathouse, the more experienced rowers greet those of us learning to row with smiles and enthusiasm. They wear t-shirts and visors with the club name. They are tall and short, wiry and robust. They ask our names and remember them when they see us again. They encourage us to join the club after the class ends. You'll see, one says, you'll get addicted to this. I wonder how welcoming they'd be if they were in the boat with me. Five weeks into the class, I mistakenly put a port oar into my starboard oar lock. I struggle to remember everything I need to do, how to hold the oars, to keep my posture upright, to notice if the boat is listing to one side, to remember my seat number so that when the coxswain shouts to me to join in or drop out, I respond without hesitation. The safety of the boat could depend on it. I catch a crab. The blade of the oar is caught by competing forces in the water, and the handle slams into my chest with a drive that threatens to send me overboard. The boat has to stop while I regain control. I am embarrassed, despite assurances that this happens to everyone. I don't want to be the weak link. Nonetheless, before the class ends, I ask Joe, do you want to join the club? Yes. Practice is scheduled so we can be on the water while it is calm and rowers can make it to work on time. So even though Joe and I have both just retired, we set our alarms for 4.15 a.m. Rowing becomes a routine, a practice, a meditation. The coach rides in a motorized launch, runs us through drills, corrects body position. There is more to learn. 
subtle moves like contracting the leg on the high side of the boat or moving the oar handles a centimeter up or down can help bring the shell into balance. There is no room for thoughts other than those needed to move the boat smoothly, efficiently, together. We don't talk in the boat or as we get the boat ready or put it away. No one asks what anyone does outside the boathouse. All that matters is what we do when we're together. The boat digs into the soft flesh of my shoulder when I carry it, but no one suggests that Joe and I might need help because we are older. They do not expect us to compensate for lack of power with wisdom or humor. They do not treat us like we're cute because we're learning at this age. We accept each other's quirks and mistakes, strengths and limitations, because we are a boat, a community, not individuals. Jo doesn't tell anyone in the boathouse about her cancer. When she was first diagnosed, when her kidney was removed and she was told there was no sign the cancer had progressed to other organs or lymph nodes and there was no need for chemotherapy or radiation, she told family, friends, colleagues. Almost two years later, a CT showed tumors in her lungs, shadows the size of sesame seeds. She was hospitalized for a week at a time over the course of several months as toxins were pumped into her body in an attempt to convince her immune system that it had to rally, had to step up to this challenge. Joe's assistant set up a schedule so there was someone at her bedside round the clock, another set of eyes and ears to watch for signs of a sudden drop in her blood pressure or notice that she was talking nonsense or seeing sheep dance on her bedsheets. And so she never felt alone. Her pale skin became flushed and hot, pink and itchy, like she was covered in poison ivy. We rubbed lotion on her legs and arms and back in an attempt to soothe. We slept in a leather recliner in a semi-lit room that smelled like antiseptic and Neutrogena. I wrote notes almost daily on an internet site where people who cared about Jo could keep up on her progress and send her messages that often framed cancer as a competition, a race she could win, an opponent she could defeat. You're strong, they said, as though cancer defeats only the weak. When the treatment was over, the progress of the tumor stemmed, the meal trains discontinued, the word remission said in the same sentence as her name. Joe and I talked about how cancer defines someone, becomes part of your identity, marks you, how you always have cancer or are a cancer survivor. We talked about whether people avoided her or avoided asking about her health and whether others thought about her only in terms of her health. How does one find the balance? We talked about how she could come into harmony with diagnosis and treatment and a new normal, how she could incorporate her doctor's prognosis at the end of immunotherapy, think years, not decades, into decisions about everything from home improvements to international travel. She asked a counselor, when do you tell someone you've just started dating about a cancer that might come back? The counselor deflected the question, everyone in your age group has or will have health issues. Was that approach avoidance or the new normal? Joe tells me she isn't trying to hide her cancer from her teammates, but she doesn't mention it because three years after immunotherapy, she isn't sure it's relevant. We talk one day about how this means no one on the rowing team thinks of her in terms of cancer. What does she gain by being with people who assume she is as healthy as she looks? What is the cost of withholding from people something both profoundly meaningful and temporarily insignificant? How much has cancer become part of her identity? How vulnerable do we have to be to be part of a community? In 1959, when Dorothy Marie Buter took her vows as a sister of the Good Shepherd, a nun left her family and lived with members of her order, drawing strength from that community rather than from a husband. She wore a long white gown to signify that she became the Bride of Christ, was given a new name, a symbol of her new identity. After Vatican II, 
when nuns began wearing modified habits and then common dress, many took back the names they were given at birth. Those of us who were in Catholic schools returned from summer vacation to find Sister Mary Joseph had become Sister Nancy O'Leary, and Sister Incarnation was now Sister Catherine Pucci. Sister Madonna kept her name, even though she added her family name, Buter. Madonna is from the Italian meaning my lady. It became associated with Mary through glorified artistic representations. Madonna of the Carnation by Leonardo da Vinci. The Madonna with child, with saints, with angels, flowers, birds, paintings by Botticelli, Fra Angelico, Michelangelo. A gentleman in adoration before the Madonna by Moroni. It is not a humble name. Sister told me that she didn't request it, and I don't ask her why she kept it. She tells me how being given that name, and the synchronicity of her grandfather's deathbed conversion, and the propitious day chosen for her to take her vows, was evidence of having been called proof of specialness that countered her superior's doubts about whether she was right for the convent. Doubts that remained years after she took her vows. Sister Madonna had not been at her first assignment for long before she became the subject of a community meeting that she still refers to as a kangaroo court. The other sisters stood one at a time and gave examples of Sister Madonna's failings as a person and as a member of the community, vague references to a lack of humility and cooperation. Sister Madonna was stoic. She denied the Mother Superior's report that she found Sister Madonna in the chapel afterward in tears. She told me they didn't win that day, that her request for a transfer wasn't a sign of defeat or weakness. At the time, it didn't occur to me that whatever compelled me to explore Sister Madonna's story might have been a sign, might have relevance for me down the road. I thought my interest in her was one triathlete to another, one female body to another, two women discouraged by culture and convention from pursuing athletic interests. Later, I would read Carolyn Meese's book, Sacred Contracts, which draws on Jungian psychoanalytic theory to suggest that we are destined even before birth to encounter certain individuals in our lives at certain times. Some appear only briefly, some stay with us a long time, but each is there with a purpose, a message. Someone on the rowing team asked Joe how long she and I have been friends. Joe smiles. Since July 1, 1976. A different rower asks how we met. I say, my husband and her ex-husband were family medicine residents together. We were the first group of residents' wives who planned to have careers even after our husbands set up practice. We bonded over that. Joe nods and recites the medical auxiliary pledge we were given to read, how it mandated that we keep the home hearth swept free of pettiness. She rolls her eyes the way I remember her doing that day in 1976. I recall that wives in the classes ahead of ours assured us that we'd get pregnant soon, reminded us we didn't have to work now because our husbands had salaries. We forged friendships because we were breaking new ground without mentors to guide us and needed each other for support. When our husbands finished, the class dispersed as we chose where to settle, build practices, raise children. Joe and I saw each other from time to time, but mostly we lost touch until she, newly divorced, moved to Portland, Oregon. And a few years later, as part of rebuilding our marriage, my husband and I also moved to Portland. Joe and I picked up our friendship the way we do with just a few people in our lives, the ones who have been with us at the turning points. The ease with which we rec reconnected was like riding a bike after a long absence. Sacred Contract. When Sister Madonna finished telling me about the accusations from her community, she dropped her chin, looked at her empty coffee mug, her confident voice softer. She shook her head almost imperceptibly. I must not have been that close to the other nuns, or I would have picked up on the signs that I wasn't fitting in. I wanted to reach across the table, touch her hand, gripping the mug. 
To this point, her story had been practiced, told with the confidence of an athlete. This admission seemed fresh, raw. Her chin lifted again and her voice shifted as she regained her footing. She related how she finished graduate degrees, then spent eight months in San Francisco, four months in North Dakota, time in New York. In each new assignment, more criticism. Some said she was too innovative. Some said she was too conservative. By the time Sister Madonna arrived in Spokane in 1971, her frequent moves marked her as a misfit. She had difficulty explaining the tension that dogged her wherever she went. She shrugged her shoulders as she told me her sister said she was lacking in community, a loner, obedient, but unpredictable. The Spokane nuns soon had grievances too. There was another tribunal. I asked Sister Madonna why she stayed, why she never asked to be released from her vows as so many nuns did. She told me she didn't want to be driven out. That would have been a defeat. She acknowledged the toll it took. My spirit was dying, she said. She went to a spiritual retreat on the Oregon coast. A priest there recommended she run on the beach. I told her I started running on the Oregon coast too. The sand is firm at low tide, the rhythm of waves like a mantra repeating, the ocean a reminder of the feminine, of power. When she returned from the coast, she continued to work long hours, felt isolated from her community. She burned out. The community released her from all her duties. Spokane is a city near mountains and lakes, bisected by a river that flows into the Columbia, the smell of lilac and cedar, bored, hurting. Sister Madonna remembered how she felt running at the coast, and she ran. Down Indian Trail Road, on the path beside the river, up trails on the nearby mountain, legs burning, lungs aching. She felt her problems diminished by the magnitude of the sky and the mountain and a river that didn't see boulders as an obstacle. She began to race. The very qualities that had been a source of conflict for her in the convent now served her as an athlete. Grit, perseverance, courage, power, purpose. All the stories I'd read about Sister Madonna portrayed only the heroic narrative, the synchronicity of her being advised by a priest to take up running and how that released a desire and a gift, replaced one identity with another, one community with another. I didn't know why she shared the more vulnerable story with me, and I was unsure what to believe about it. I could believe she chafed against her vow of humility, believed her community found her aloof and arrogant, who would be more difficult to live with in a community of nuns committed to poverty and humility than someone who believed in her own exceptionalness and exceptionalness? I can also believe in the cruelty of nuns who confuse humility with mediocrity. Sister Madonna's depiction of her public disgrace is reminiscent of those times in Catholic school when a nun publicly shamed a child who had transgressed. Those nuns, those times when a nun shamed me. When the new dean summoned me to a disciplinary hearing just a few months after she was hired, I had to think back to high school, to being summoned to the convent, to remember the last time I'd been reprimanded. The accusations were preposterous and untrue and difficult to refute because they were impossible to prove. I was not stoic. My heart beat rapidly. My hand shook. I babbled defensively. My colleagues would have been supportive, but the dean told me I would be fired if I told them I'd been disciplined. More bullying followed, gaslighting in which the dean held me accountable to rules that changed without warning. She undermined me with students, marginalized me, demoted me. I knew she wanted me to resign before my contract ended. I ranted to my husband with each new incident, the injustice, the exhaustion of trying to make sense of the senseless the feeling of isolation from a community that had embraced me. Almost as frequently I talked to Jo. As a friend, her compassion buoyed me. As a dean whose academic career was much longer than mine, her perspective that I was being treated unfairly sustained me. I don't want to quit, I said to both her and my husband. I don't want her to win. 
but bullying is dependent on a power imbalance. It's not a fair fight, not something that can be overcome with grit and perseverance. When, after two years, my contract was not renewed and I was effectively fired, I expected to feel the way I did at the end of a triathlon, bent over with pain and exhaustion, but finally able to breathe deeply. I expected to feel a sense of accomplishment that I hadn't surrendered. Instead, I was angry. I engaged in fantasies of vengeance and retaliation. I was bored. The day seemed endless. I noticed dusty floors and dirty countertops and resented that I had time to attend to them. I had interests. I wrote. I exercised. I volunteered. It all felt like killing time, waiting for something with meaning to emerge. I applied for jobs, but I knew that being in my mid-60s, I should not expect to be competitive, especially in academia, especially without a letter of reference from my previous employer. Still, I was hurt when I was passed over. I was jealous of the way Joe retired. Our post-retirement lives looked the same, but I envied the way she got to control the end of her career, the way her achievements were properly noted, celebrated, and archived. The darkness of the wet Northwest winter seeped into my bones, where I also stored my anger. When I first start to row, I don't notice the weight of my resentment dissipating on the river like early morning fog. On the water, I empty my mind to focus on the motions of my body as I move through the sequence, push down with my heels just after my blade connects with the water, hang on the oar handle, wait until my seat is pushed back completely before I swing my back in unison with the seven other women in the boat. Then at the last moment, pull the oar into my body, keeping my core engaged. My quads start to bulge the way they did when I trained for triathlons. I feel my biceps strain against the sleeves of my sweat-soaked shirt, feel exhilarated at the end of 10 hard pushes, a power 10, at a stroke rate greater than our usual pace. Notice bleeding blisters on the palms of my hands only when practice is over. I pull my own weight. The effort of hoisting the boat overhead and resting it on my shoulders starts to feel easier. I think it is due to new muscle. I don't realize there is more lightness in every move I make. Some mornings, just as we are heading back to the dock after a hard row, I notice the office building shining in first light. I look up and see clouds overhead starting to show pink. I hear the city waking up, meeting another day alive. I think that whatever happens the rest of the day, I have had this time on the river in the company of women. The rhythm of rowing settles into my muscles. I bring it home with me. The need to stay in the moment, the importance of balance, the feeling of my own power moving through me. At the end of the summer, Joe and I sign up for our first race. 5,000 meters on a lake near Seattle. We schedule extra practices with the other novices who will be in the boat. We work harder, longer, better. A few weeks before the race, Jo gets her regular CT. In the three years since she completed immunotherapy, these have become almost routine. She texts me. Her lung nodules show growth. There is a new tumor, very small, in her spine. Can I come over? Yes. She comes over and we do what friends do when there is bad news. Joe is prescribed an oral medication with side effects that include high blood pressure, fatigue, diarrhea, sores on the hands and feet. I don't know if I'll be able to race, Joe says, and I don't want to let the boat down. The race is canceled due to exceptionally high winds. Synchronicity. We are nearing the end of our first season of rowing. Joe texts me in the morning, headache, dizzy, blood pressure 180, not rowing today. With high blood pressure, the exertion of rowing could cause a stroke. Joe tells the coach she is being treated for cancer. The coach seats Joe in front of me in the boat. Stroke partners. The irony of that label is not lost on us. Her shoulders are covered by a UPF shirt 
because the drugs make her pale skin even more sun sensitive. I watch them to know when to swing my body. I watch them to see if they start to slump, if she looks fatigued. I listen to her breathe. We are not to talk in the boat, but I whisper, are you okay? When I sense she is tired, I will the coxswain to rotate us out and give us a rest. Over the winter, we continue to get up in the dark, drive to the boathouse to row on machines, be with our community. The boathouse smells like sweat and grease. We listen to playlists from the 80s, rhythmic tunes that recall jazzercise classes, keep us engaged. Without the need to balance the boat or feather the oar or move in concert with seven other women, I can concentrate on the movement of my body, build muscle and muscle memory. There is opportunity to talk, to pass time, to ask about lives outside the boat, to get to know each other at a different level. Some of the more experienced rowers are in their 60s. Unlike Joe and me, they have been rowing for decades. Even without Title IX, they found their way to a sport where they could harness the power of their bodies, compete, be with other women. Joe has a CT every three months. The first shows the tumor shrinking 40%, the next one a little more. By the time we are back on the water the following spring, the river is high and fast and muddy. The coxswain steers us past logs that have washed into the water with the spring thaw. I am surprised at my longing to be in the boat, even on days when it's raining and the water is rough. A bad day on the river is better than a good day on a rowing machine, I tell my husband as I roll out of bed in the dark. Each day the sun lights up the sky a bit earlier. We pass a sea lion resting on the abutment of a bridge, hear the cry of an osprey overhead. Over the winter, Joe's oncologist added medications to lower blood pressure and stop diarrhea. Joe found that a vitamin cocktail dripped into her veins boosted her energy. The side effects of Joe's treatment are more manageable or perhaps have just become the new normal. Her CT is stable, 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 stable. I notice that when Joe and I are out of the rowing rotation for a brief rest, she sits up tall, breathes with more ease than the previous autumn. While there are still days when she has trouble lifting the boat out of the water, carrying it back to the boathouse, she notices she can't fit into last summer's t-shirt. My arms are too big, she says, smiling. Should we join a group rowing on Lago Maggiore between Italy and Switzerland? Yes. Should we go to every Women's World Cup venue in France in 2019 and guest row with a club in every city we visit? Yes. What would we talk about if we didn't have rowing, Joe asked me one day. I wonder if we would talk more about cancer, about health. We don't take long walks or hike anymore because the soles of her feet are sore, though not a problem pushing in the boat. I wonder if we would respond to her fatigue with more lunch dates and phone banking for political candidates. I wonder if we would contemplate traveling to Italy, France. I wonder what that new normal would have been. We sign up to race in the row for the Cure Regatta. This is not our first race. In that race, I could barely keep up with the pace set by younger and stronger rowers in the front of the boat, combined with the tendency of inexperienced novices to explode at the start. The splash of flailing oars drenched my handle, and I struggled to hold on to it. I missed a lot of water. I didn't feel I showed what I could do, the results of my hard training. And yet, it was also clear that even at my best, there was an insurmountable gap between my ability and those of both the younger rowers and the 60-year-olds who had been rowing for decades. I was no Sister Madonna. Joe's experience was similar perhaps more difficult to bear because while our boat had a handicap for age, there is no handicap for rowers being treated for cancer. She brushed away tears after our first race. I feel like I'm the weak link, she said to the coach. The coach put her arms around Joe. You bring other strengths to the boat. I think grit, perseverance, courage. The day we are to row for the cure, the lake is flat the lanes for the thousand meter course visible from the team tent where it is shady and a table is stacked with fruit and cookies and deli platters. 
The sky is cloudless, the wind light. Before the race, the novice team gathers in a circle on dry grass that pricks the backs of our bare legs. We are wearing matching blue shirts and visors with the team name and logo. We talk about the people in our lives we are dedicating the race to. Mother, sister, partner, friend, some living, some not. Jo takes a deep breath and tells the team she is rowing for herself. She tells them why. When she is unable to say more, she turns to me. I could tell you, I say, what Jo has been rowing through, what cancer and cancer treatment does to rowing, the fatigue, high blood pressure, and diarrhea, Jo says, interrupting. I wasn't going to mention that. The women laugh, relieved to have the mood lightened. I reach over to Jo, sitting beside me on the grass. I take her hand. Her skin is warm. I go on. But I want to tell you what rowing does to a body with cancer. Jo is stronger than she was a year ago. Her body is responding to the training, despite the drugs that make her tired. And everyone in the boat contributes to that. We don't row for a cure. Rowing doesn't cure cancer. It doesn't even beat cancer. I understand the value of positive thinking, but the expectation that grit and perseverance and courage can defeat cancer only adds guilt to the load the cancer patient is carrying. But progress in rowing, that's something achievable. That's a goal to focus on, a competition where grit and perseverance have a role. Rowing may not change Joe's health, but it changes her body and changes how she feels and how she feels in her body. Rowing doesn't heal the wounds left by a bully any more than it cures cancer, but during my time on the river, like time spent running on a path winding through the woods, I am aware of my own power in my body. I feel exhausted not from being in a toxic work environment, but from pushing through a physical barrier. I breathe in the morning air as the sun starts to reflect on the black water, and it lifts me up the way eight, men, eight women lift a 62-foot boat and settle it on their shoulders. That was absolutely beautiful. So lovely. And what an amazing way that you've blended three different stories together, your personal story, and the friendship story, and of course your observation of an extremely successful uh, older female athlete who came from a really, really unusual background. Now, tell the listeners where they can get the book. I think we've lost Lois's sound, which is a real pain. I'm not hearing you at all. Okay, so I'm going to make a rash assumption that the book is available on Amazon and other good bookstores. And I will put a link in the show notes so that people can find where to get it. And then what we'll do is, if anyone would like to collect, connect with Lois, I'll also make sure that I include her website details in the show notes. Thank you for listening to this slightly unusual rowing chat, but I hope you'll agree that actually this has been just the most marvelous way to break out of our everyday lives and feel and hear and engage with a story that for me has real empathy and sympathy and showcases the incredible power of both friendships and the sport that most of us really love. Till next time, bye-bye. <laughs>